Hi, everybody. Hi, Dana. Hi. So, Hello, everyone. So Dana's got questions today. We're going to go through some stuff, and I'm excited because Dana comes up with some great questions, and she kind of weaves you around. So I'm excited for whatever we're doing. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Yes, thank you uh, for having me on your platform, honey. I'm excited to be here as usual. And mm -hmm. today's topic is soul contracts. So we are going to talk all, all right. about soul contracts, uh, the life review, review before we incarnate, um, core consciousnesses, which is the values that we wish to you know, experience on earth, and then also clearing the soul contract the genetic line and what the body needs to clear so we'll end with um, some fun questions that I that I had as well so I wanted to uh, start with these books that I actually read a long time ago when I first started my awakening journey of souls destiny of souls I see this was the first one that uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Michael wrote and he basically moves you through uh, the process of life between lives going through the passing over point and then moving into soul worlds going into your soul family going into your class if you want to call it that your groups the study that you do the, the color that you are in the soul uh, world and how you elevate from one color to the next and that connotes the actual um frequency yeah the frequency where you're at in the soul world, uh, the experience that you have, things like that. And then looking at a life review, a pre-life review before you move in uh, back into a body on earth. So it's all this fascinating, these fascinating things that we already do, uh, that we've been doing for eons. Some of us, the older uh, souls and all souls in general on earth. And then really kind of dissecting that. So we're, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about that, but mostly about the soul contracts. Um, so with regards to the, what I, what I really want to focus on is the ring of destiny and kind of looking at where, what we're going to do as we move into the next life. So Dr. Okay. Newton calls it the ring of destiny. It's a place to select lives where we plan to have, um, what we plan to do before we come earthside. He calls it the ring of destiny. And for me, I've been to Epcot in Orlando, so in Canada and I believe China, there's a video screen that goes all around you. So if you've ever been in that environment, maybe it's a sports bar or something like that, you can kind of visualize what that looks like. And he explains it like that. But I know, honey, you've talked about that as well. That you had these experiences or you were given your experiences of pre-life, pre-re-emerging onto the earth plane in your body. So mm -hmm. just wanted you to talk about what that felt like, what that was, what that looked like. Okay. So mm -hmm. I was given this from my soul and the experience, I'm not positive that this is what it actually looks like, but this is how a human mind can experience it and understand what it is. So basically I was in just complete light and I knew that that was source and I knew that I was basically choosing and it took a while for me to agree to come back into a human body. Um, and I came with someone else. So I actually have worked out that this is my father that I came with. So he actually showed up before I did and he was a walk-in and then I was born, you know, um, into his family obviously, but we went together. So we were together. And I think he was the convincing person, <laughs> convincing being like, yeah, yeah, let's go do it. You know, let's go deal with Ascension. <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't know. So I finally said yes, I think. And I feel like I have been to earth over and over and over. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of fatigued by it. Like I was, I, I wanted a longer break, but I knew that it was a good idea for me to go. So I just kind of gave in and went, but I could see our light bodies floating through this, like just 
think of like a jellyfish of light, right? So we were floating through that and we went into a certain room and basically there was like um, a wall where you could just go to the wall and program your life. So what was my life going to look like? So we did that together, he and I. And we just looked like light bodies from Cocoon, you know, how they come out of those cocoons and they just have a body, but you can't see any features on it because it's just made of light. And I know that I spent nine years with him before I was born, basically um, talking to him, helping him upgrade his own body system. Um, so like the Kundalini awakening, that happened through me. Um, and there was a little girl who could see me and she said, the lady in the gold dress that lives with you. So she said that to my father. Um, but I remember being really annoyed that I hadn't been able to come in earlier. So, um, you know, mom was 23 when they finally had me and they had been married since she was 18. So when I was a little kid, I was like, you mean that I could be eight years old right now? Like I was really irritated. <laughs> So that was pretty funny. Um, and basically, you know, we came in as a team, I think. And that's how it works. You come in in teams, in groups to do to do the work. And it's a game, but you're coming in as a team player, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it is a game, even though it does feel very intense at times, you oh, don't yeah. want to call it a game. It's pretty much preordained. And that's kind of what I want to focus on uh, throughout mm -hmm. this part of the the video, just like how the mechanics work. So um, Lori Ladd speaks of core consciousnesses in her uh, in her work and in her her book, The, the Divine uh, Divine Design. And basically, these are values that the soul wishes to experience. So patience, um, compassion, forgiveness, et cetera. So with regards to those, those are some specific things that we we learn through trauma, through uh, bliss, mm -hmm. through joy, we, you know, through connections, basically. And yeah. the connections, those are really important as well. So I just want to first talk about the core consciousnesses or values, whatever you want to call it. And then we'll talk about some of the soul contracts and like the actual nitty gritty of soul contracts. Yeah. So lessons is what you come in for usually. Yeah. A lot of us came in to finish up a lot of lessons and then um, the soul itself was healing all of its traumas. So that's why when you talk about like ascension, you say, you're the one who came in to heal all your genetic, you know, all your family line traumas and your soul traumas. And that's what we're doing. And that's how we're ascending and how we're pulling humanity up through the ascension process because we're healing everything. So really the biggest thing in the whole world the most important thing is to heal yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, we've been doing this pretty consistently for the last several years, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love that you designed the core of your work around that because it is, it's the meat and the potatoes or whatever you want to call it, uh, the core of what we're doing here. So it's, it, it is, it's fascinating. Now, moving into some of the actual soul contracts that we make, the unexplained emotional connections. So when you first meet your future husband or wife and you get this jolt of energy from them or when, when you first meet a best friend, that is that something that we actually create or we get to see before we move birthside and yeah. we can actually plan for it basically? Mm -hmm. We can, we can adjust it in the astral plane. So let's say you move timelines, but you still want to meet your spouse. So you're like, okay, well, we can't meet over here at the playground or at the park 
you know, so we'll meet over here instead. Let's meet at Starbucks, you know, whatever. <laughs> like, basically, you can plan it and you're constantly adjusting everything, just like you're constantly adjusting anything that you're doing. So, this is a microchasm of what we're doing in the astral plane. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. I love that. And regarding difficult soul contracts, because we don't just have these blissful relationships in our life. We have the difficult mm -hmm. soul contracts. Sometimes our closest soulmates and soulmate connections, and this is what some of the books say and some of the research I've seen says that our soulmates are our, our cl the closest person in the in the soul world or you know um the spirit world becomes our mortal nemesis or someone yeah. that ends up being our greatest teacher so that's something else to look at and just a, an example I'm, just, I'm sure everyone has a big example of that in their life but um someone that's very close to me his father abandoned him at a very young age and then his stepfather, stepfather was very abusive to him. So he has these two father figures, the biological father, the, the stepfather, that they're like horrible examples of fatherhood, which catapulted him into wanting to be a wonderful father. So that's just one of the many, many, many examples. But um, just to talk about that, that, that dynamic where you wouldn't think that person is your bestie <laughs> in the soul world and they end up being your nemesis on earth but they're really there to help you yeah they push you into the next step mm -hmm. so really humanity hasn't wanted to move into the next step very easily it's taken some hard pushes and just in general we don't move that fast especially in this density so think about like the density that we've been in we we're moving out of that we're not in third density anymore but mm -hmm. um that was a really tough it's almost like moving metal so think of it as that if you punch a piece of metal are you going to make a dent how hard do you have to do it to make a dent because uh that third density is a really thick yeah and it's yeah it's been it's probably one of the reasons why we've had to go through lessons over and over again because we're, we keep having to make a dent or to move to that next level just like you said wow okay so are any of our shadows not based on soul contracts or is it just 100 percent across the board all the shadows are based on soul contracts yeah so a shadow yeah. is based on a soul contract that was created that created a trauma. And mm -hmm. the trauma, instead of being allowed to go home to the oversoul, that shadow was usually abandoned to continue to live out those traumas. So it's like, ooh, you went and did that? That's so yucky. Like, just stay down there. Like, I don't want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So... It's been a lot of abandonment was probably one of the biggest shadows that we moved through as a collective, I would say. And that's done. Yeah. But it was a tough one. Yeah, that one seems really heavy. Uh, and then the ailments, and you definitely talk about this a lot in Healing with Honey and a lot of the videos that you make about uh, the headaches. So a headache in this lifetime could be an, a head injury in another lifetime. Uh, mm -hmm. The back pain in this life, maybe there's a broken back in another lifetime. Uh, psoriasis yeah. in this life could be some sort of skin burn uh, or being burned in another lifetime. So these, all these examples are difficulties in one transposing into another, basically. So uh, difficult lifetimes of victimization, suffering, and sac sacrifice that it can still leap us into a lot of soul growth. So just to go through some of the ailments that you've seen or heard about and possibly if you were able to follow up with that person to see how they cleared it um, or if you help them clear it, just to talk about that so that everyone's on the same page. Yeah, so there's been a lot of people that were like burned at the state, um, a mm -hmm. lot of witch stuff, a lot of um, 
you know, and these are parallel lives that are still going on. So you need to resolve that lifetime. So basically what you're doing is you're healing the version of yourself that's in that lifetime and they go home and that lifetime dissolves. So they go home to the oversoul and the lifetime just goes away. And there's infinite versions of lifetimes out there. So you have to remember that too and not get too attached to, oh, well, I was living out that lifetime over there. It's okay to go home. It really is okay. And that you're healing that version of yourself. And then you become more and more whole as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The shadow work that I was doing, I feel like I was really focusing on it. And to the point where it wasn't just happening when I was doing the meditations or, you know, waking up in the at the beginning of the, the morning while I'm still in that theta state. I remember leaving the uh, the gym and walking to the grocery store, which is right next door to each other and the shopping mall that I was at. And this, um, this little girl popped in and I could feel like it, an Amsterdam Netherlands vibe from her. She almost looked like oh. the little girl from the Grinch with the really oh. bright blue eyes and blonde hair with, with ponytails. And I could feel uh, a really uh, gross life for her at a very young age. You know, we talk about this, one of the reasons for the Great Awakening to find out what's been happening to her 12 and unders, but uh, she was in that same situation and she just wanted me to bring her back home and, and love her and hug her. And I'm like, but do we have to do it now? Like I'm walking from the gym to the grocery store. So it could, these, these clearing these lifetimes, it could happen any time of the day. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't expecting it to, to feel that much pop in at that time, but I just, I just think it's interesting. Once you start on this journey, it, it could just pop in. Now, of course we can, we have control over that, but um, I, I was allowing it. I was letting every, anything come through and I was just in my flow state. So I thought that was interesting. Um, mm -hmm. So I wanted to bring that up here. Uh, but a yeah. question that I have is, are there levels of difficulty experienced by beginner souls, intermediate souls, advanced souls? You wouldn't give a kindergartner, you know, algebra to do. So are we seeing that a lot of the, souls that have gone through some really difficulties they are more, most of the time they're more advanced or how does that look no not necessarily um okay. more advanced but also the younger souls are the ones that are not ascending in their body mm -hmm. so basically they're the healing part of it is just too difficult in the body so they're letting go of the body and they're ascending. So a lot of the younger souls have chosen to ascend without the body. And some people, their young soul has ascended and a big soul has come in and the body is still here. So, yeah. It is yeah, a no. very wild time mm, right now. Absolutely. And you refer to that as a, that's referred to as a walk-in that we, you just spoke about mm -hmm. with your father. Very interesting. Um, I did ref, right around 2019, uh, 20, before we had all the crazy stuff happening on the planet, I, I had a feeling that there was going to be a lot more walk-ins coming in. Mm -hmm. They would just, you know, want to be here at this time physically. So yeah, at this time, I want to talk about there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about soul contracts and the size of a soul contract. We have the small ones. For instance, this morning I was show I was we were we were getting the kids to school first day of school, and I stepped in the grass because we parked next to the grass, and I showed the kids, hey, there's that the big ant pile. Don't step in that. And I was the one that got bit <laughs> by the ant, like. Wait, is that a soul contract? So do we have small soul contracts, like a bug bite, um, the medium soul contracts, and we definitely have that, um, and, and other sizes. How does that look? Yeah. Well, and a lot of the things that are happening that are irritating, like getting bit by a bug or um, stubbing your toe or just getting irritated in general, that's a shadow of yours trying to be noticed. 
usually. So it's something trying to get noticed. Um, for you, I feel like that was mostly just to warn the kids. But because mm. you were acknowledging it and feeling like, oh, well, they're going to, they could get bit. You were the one who got bit <laughs> instead. Because um, you manifested it right there. Instantly. Um, yeah. So, but really like just some of your soul contracts are massive. They may be that you have to overcome something in your soul family that has been going on since the beginning of time you know and then other ones are like <laughs> you have to learn how to bake a cake you know like something very simple or something very intense and complicated that could take you quite a long like months and months to deal with versus something that could maybe take five minutes yeah wow so interesting yeah. And um, a lot of our soul contracts are internal, but then we have external soul contracts with, you know, the other large mm -hmm. and huge soul contracts. So a large soul contract could be something like a teacher, a guide, an author of a book, uh, touching millions of lives. And also um, something huge, someone like Mr. T, Louise Hay, Wayne Dyer, someone that really puts information out there that goes into the masses and lasts mm -hmm. for a very long time. Uh, even after they have uh, passed over. So is, yeah. yeah. Is that something that you, do you see that a lot? Is that more rare or is that something that any soul could have it? Um, any soul could have it. And it really, it doesn't matter if they start out in a really small way. Like maybe they started out in a village somewhere and you never thought they would see humanity at all. Like they would only stay with their small little tribe. But their destiny was to come out of that and to go and share with the world everything. So you just don't ever know on this level what, you know, that's why it's really important to follow your soul. You know, the guidance that your soul is trying to give to you and to let go of trying to be in control of everything all the time. Yeah, I agree with that. And the fact that we have these core consciousnesses or the values that we want to instill, and then we have fears around those, and that's where the ego comes in and kind of keeps you away. If it just if you have to write that book or get on YouTube, you and it, you the fear is just overcoming you. Do everything you can to move through it because you're breaking soul contracts with people that are relying on you for that information. Mm -hmm. And I think both of us had that feeling before, you know, spirit was saying, or our higher self was saying, you know, get out there, get on social media, um, you know, start the web page, all of those things. It just, yeah. Yeah, if you don't take that leap, there's going to be so many soul contracts that you're not. Uh, allowing to come to fruition and helping others. And I think that's, especially your audience, making sure that we we talk about that a lot because it's, I think it's so important that the fear can consume you. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, and I think my audience is pretty advanced. So they're yeah. going to have a lot of their own stuff that's going to be showing up for them to be doing. And a lot of them are, you know. Mm -hmm. Like they're branching out and clearing the ego is like massive. If you can clear that ego out of the way, your life is going to be so much different because it's basically like a little screaming Mimi in the background that's like, no, no, stay small. Oh no, they're not going to like your nose. No, no, they're not going to, you know, like who cares mm -hmm. what the ego says? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Okay. So um, we wouldn't give the topic justice if we didn't talk about the NPCs. So what type of soul contracts do NPCs have? Do they even have a soul contract if they are just a human um, embodiment to fill space? How does that look? Yeah, to fill space. Um, their soul contract, like ultimately, if they have a human consciousness and not a big soul, is just to ascend and be here for ascension 
but not necessarily in the body you yeah. know so um their basic soul contract would be to reunite with humanity as a soul group mm -hmm. it's, yeah. a, it's a general soul contract yeah very okay. simple that makes sense yeah right and uh what will soul contracts look like as we move into the golden age they're going to be more fun we're going to know what they are so there will be no veil so you'll know what your soul contracts are and you'll be able to change them if you're like changing your mind about things you'll be able to see the big picture as well so let's say today I'm supposed to drive for a hundred miles to go and pick up a piece of a tool for my husband. Okay. And if I don't do it, then something that I care about won't get fixed. So I'll be able to see all of that. Whereas right now it would be just, oh, well, I don't want to go and do that. That doesn't sound fun. So I'm not going to go. So really, you'll just be able to see everything. Mm -hmm. That's good. It it helps to see everything. Um, and even yeah. a lot of people talk about um, if you get off the wrong exit and you have to get back on the highway or you're running 20 minutes late, there's a reason for that. Maybe you were supposed to be late because of um, missing something that could have been catastrophic or things like that. Uh, we hear a lot of those types of uh, stories. So as we clear the soul contracts and we work, we do the above work as above, so below, our body requires something. The body asks you to do something. Uh, intuitively, you know that you need to do something. So uh, yeah. as I was connecting to that information and I was listening to videos, I heard... Um, one of the folks that I listened to, Lori Ladd, she was also talking about this, doing a fast, a water fast. And she's right. doing a five water, five day water fast. And for me, I couldn't fit five days in. I was looking at my calendar, I couldn't fit it in. But it was definitely something that jumped out at me and said, yes, let's do it. So um, I wanna talk about that here. Uh, and this may not be for everyone, it really, it really isn't. There are some people that don't need to do a, a fast at all that we can talk about, but basically, for me, the water fast was just to really clear all of the soul contract, all the work that I was doing to get my body up to speed to the work that I was doing. And mm -hmm. the first one, so I did a three day water fast. It was just water, distilled water. I did a lot of minerals, um, the burdock root tea, lemon and water. I was really picky. So I didn't even, you know, floss my teeth with mint. <laughs> <laughs> floss which okay. I'm sure you could do I still brush my teeth with like toothpaste but still I was really picky of, of what I did and I made sure it was it was a very clean water fast with no um uh no you know I wasn't cheating at all but anyways um so I did it August 4th 5th and 6th and I was able to do it and start it on the new moon or the new earth which um, is what it really is called and uh, that was good because anything you start on a new cycle you can move it into the entire cycle the rest of the the month so that that's helpful and the energy with the new earth it felt better to start it that day so yeah i have fasted in the past and i got really hangry <laughs> so you know that movie little shop of horrors with mm -hmm. um the plant that's it, it was like late 80s that it came out and there's a plant that always wants to be fed so it says feed me seymour <laughs> Ah, so my belly was making that sound like in the past so I'm like man I don't want to get to that point point. Uh, and a side note on that movie that plant is from outer space and it needs human uh, fluids in order to survive there's like disclosure everywhere yeah very yeah. interesting as you dig deep but anyways um, so when I, when I felt hungry I decided to make sure that I honored the people that could not eat in my lineage, in my genetic line, things like that. So these are ways to navigate that. And as I was thinking more about it, I realized, and I dropped in from my higher self, that I was fasting through my crystalline body. So that meant I was <clears throat> gonna get food from the ether, from sunlight, from earthing, obviously from water. And I wasn't hungry. 
and I was I got a little jittery uh, during the lunch time and the dinner time, and I just um, wanted to chew, but I didn't really necessarily get those like groaning hunger pains. So if you do decide to fast, uh, think of it, think of that. You know, you are going to be, because our crystalline bodies are so up to speed right now, we get to test them out. And I was able to test it out and it showed up for me, which I, I thought was beautiful. Like it was a reminder that we, we really are doing this. Um, also, the first day of the fast, I was able to go into the um, energy enhancing system by Sandra Michael. We, I have one probably 15 minutes away from me, which is nice. Not everyone has that. So I was able to uh, lay the foundation for the, for the fast on that Sunday. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And I started seeing differences being with, between like a 3D fast and a 5D fast. The 3D fast, there's physical hunger, you know, you get really hangry. But the 5D fast is psychological and crystalline. And I was able to really connect to that part and I was able to get through it very well. So something that came up for me, kept on coming up was go with, um, in order to, well, go without in order to go within. And I really was able to reboot my hard drive because of that. And as I did more research, I started seeing that fasting and praying comes up over 30 times in uh, the Bible. And I know the Bible, you know, we talk about this all the time. It's been rewritten, Council of Nicaea, you know, Constantine. We, we know all of that. But I find it interesting that older Bibles, like uh, this one that I got when I was really little. Um, my mom gave it to me because you know, I grew up Christian. It is a King James Version Bible. And so there's two passages, two verses that I wanted to bring up that were actually they've since been taken out of um, the newer versions of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So Matthew 7, uh, verses 20 and 21 says, and uh Jesus, or Yeshua, said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, ye, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Uh, Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. So he brings up prayer and fasting in that verse. And then also Mark 9, verses 29, where Yeshua was actually casting out a demon from a, like a foul spirit from a, a child. That's the background of the, the verse. And um, Jesus or Yeshua said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but prayer and fasting. So this comes up over and over again. And we know that Yeshua spent 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness fasting. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what is this connection between prayer and fasting and, and manifestation really? And why is it being pushed out of these new versions of the Bible? I So the gut brain connection, mm -hmm. it's really strong. It also takes 30% of your energy to digest food. And I don't think we're supposed to be eating three times a day. It doesn't feel normal to me. Um, you're supposed to eat when you're hungry. So what I get is that it basically takes the brain out of it. Yeah. So the brain is not functioning anymore. It Your spirit is functioning. So it makes more room for the spiritual to come in because the only brain that's really working is the heart. So, because the gut and the brain are very, very connected. And if the gut is at rest, then the brain is also at rest. Makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, and even the word fasting, they they didn't, we don't call it starving. Uh, no. We call it fast for a reason like what is it really accelerating is, is it accelerating anything I yeah feel like it, mm -hmm. well and we are we are crystalline now so realizing that you know for you I feel like just taking that break let your your mind realize that your body was crystalline now 
So it can function in a different way. It's almost like turning the light switch off and on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And the fasting moved into what I brought in on a daily basis. So sometimes I'll just be sitting, doing something at doing the laundry or, you know, cooking dinner. And then, oh, I could be listening to like an Intel video. And this time it was like, no, I just, I want to listen to music because it was too much. I was very gentle with myself, but mm -hmm. I really fasted from a lot more than just food because of how much my, I wanted to take a break, but at the same time, everything kind of came into alignment. It was, it was very, very nourishing. Um, and just to bring up some folks that probably should not fast, uh, again, do your research. If it sounds like something you want to do, um, of course, start looking into it. But, um, you know, pregnant women, women that are nursing, um, men women that are menstruating shouldn't necessarily do it at that time of the month. Uh, children that are growing up, anyone with dietary needs uh, where you need to take um, your medication or take it with a, with a meal. And also... The um, anyone that has diabetes and you need your blood sugar at a certain level. So, but again, do your research. We're not doctors. So we're not here to advise this, but it was for me, it was just a, such a hard reset. It felt really good. Um, so with regards to wrapping this up, I'd like to invite Yeshua, Mary Magdalene and Mother Mary into the conversation to offer any additional insight into prayer and fasting because it comes up so much um, in the old older versions of the Bible and because they're trying to take it out of the Bible. They just, they put it in as a footnote now or they leave it out entirely. Yeah, it comes through as loving yourself and also opening your cup. So it basically came in as the chalice. So it's like so much more will come in when you make room for it. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to be in the 3D anymore. We're not in it now. So the 3D was very focused on food and the physical. And we're moving out of that. So anything you can do to start that process right now is really good um yeah in the they just want you to relax mainly that's what i'm getting relax and let things start to change that's the biggest message that i get from them they want people to be in flow which means letting go of like the drama of the 3d ideas mm -hmm. you know like i have to go over here right now and then i have this huge list to complete today and i have you know letting go of that and just being in flow and letting your life be unfolding in front of you and you're creating like this beautiful world for yourself that's what they really are focused on helping humanity do yeah I love that. And it definitely feels like that is the next step for us, mm -hmm. the um, more awakened folks, If whether you've been awake for a day or, you know, over 10 years. At some point, you're going to get to a point where you don't necessarily need to go down all the rabbit holes and you you continue to get into flow and continue to move through it. So seeing it this way, you know, if you once you're in third grade, let's say, uh, you would be really interested in getting to know all the, the information and, you know, keep getting into the Intel videos. But after a while, you're going to graduate that and you won't want to listen to it as much. You're going to move and focus more on Ascension with the number, the number 17. That was the last uh, drop that we, we saw. It was Ascension and it was really prominent and important and we haven't heard from them in a quite a long time so that's really for me that it always jumps out when I want to go too far down or do too much research I kind of reel it back now as opposed yeah. to two years ago when I didn't do that I, I just kept going 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 uh, but yeah I think we're we're for the folks that are watching 
your videos and videos like this where they're very uplifting and elevated, it's time to focus on, a, you know, more on ascension. Uh, whether it's fasting, a juice fast, a fruit fast, what I, I know you did that a while ago, honey, with just eating fruit for three days, that's a fast as well. So it is very manageable. Find something that works for you. Mm -hmm. And love yourself through it, whatever mm -hmm. you're doing, and allow yourself to experience what's good. I worked with somebody yesterday and they were listing. A lot of things that were like, oh, but I didn't do this and I didn't do this in my life, so I'm not worthy. But I'm like, you're worthy because you showed up here. That's all that matters. So basically, you know, you're worthy because you're here. And that's the biggest message I feel like we need to get is we are all worthy. And... That was a program that was created to keep people small. So allowing yourself to have the love that in your life that you want and let it come from the inside of you. Let the happiness come from the inside of you and just like be yourself and emote the beauty that is you. Yeah. Right. That's so beautiful. Yeah. And creating that space to do it, um, having a clear mm -hmm. canvas instead of having that canvas jumbled up with words and being all confused, just creating that canvas where you can do that, creating that time. Yeah. So. Yeah. The fasting is simplifying things. So mm -hmm. do what you can to simplify is what I would say. And it doesn't have to be fasting. It could be something else. Right. Mm -hmm. That's Love great. It. Thank you. Thanks yeah. everybody for listening. <laughs> Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you. This is always, as always, it's always wonderful to be here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye everybody.